This is an important episode, my flying filmmaker friends. Today, we're looking at a list of features, modes, settings, and tips that you might not know about our Mini 3 Pro. So the first thing you might not know is that you do not need a subject in the scene to gain all the benefits of the subject tracking modes. Now this can come in really handy if you're at a beautiful location and you want to use one of the automated tracking modes such as spotlight or point of interest, but maybe at this location there isn't a strong singular subject or point of interest to draw that tracking box over. You can still use these modes even if you don't have a subject or a point of interest. All you need to do is draw that box over the location that you want to do a point of interest or a spotlight move around and this can even be just a point on the ground for example. Then you'll see the tracking box appear. Now this is the crucial thing to do here is you need to fly the drone left or right a few seconds until that tracking box changes to a location pin. Changing to this location pin now signifies that the drone is no longer going to try to visually track a subject and instead it's going to use the geolocation of that pin to smoothly orbit around. So now you can utilize spotlight and point of interest modes to have the drone smoothly orbit around a beautiful landscape scene utilizing the cinematic compound movements of those tracking modes. In addition to this and something you may not know is you can use this location pin for more stable orbits when using point of interest mode. And what that means is normally when using point of interest you draw that tracking box around your moving subject and the drone starts the movement it's using the visual sensors to track the subject and continually do little micro adjustments to the camera to make sure that the subject is center framed. Oh, these little micro adjustments look so amateur. I consider them unusable. If, however, you draw that box around yourself or a location right next to you, then again, fly the drone left or right for a few seconds until that tracking box changes to a location pin. Then start your point of interest flight. So now the drone is executing the orbit flight it's not continually using the visual sensors to try and keep the subject center framed with those micro corrections. An additional thing that this tip allows you to do now is move around independently in the scene even if you're using these tracking modes because the drone is flying around a fixed geo pin. It's no longer tracking what you do so it allows you to walk freely through the scene even though the drone is executing an orbit. You'll now have smooth footage with smooth cinematic compound movements and some pretty dynamic shots. Give it a try and tag me. I would love to see it. This next step is super important if you want the highest video quality possible from the DJI Mini 3 Pro. So this gal features a dual native ISO of 100 and 800 but only in 24, 25 and 30 frames per second. So in these frame rates, the camera sensor, it'll automatically integrate the video captured by the two sets of circuits at the different ISO values, giving you a little bit better dynamic range. However, when you switch to the higher frame rates, such as 48, 50, and 60 frames a second, then the drone will not integrate these images. It won't be using the dual native ISO. So you'll have a little less dynamic range. The image quality won't be quite as good. You can make sure you have the dual native ISO is active by making sure you see that little HQ icon next to your frames per second you select. Ah, uh, here's something important I just recently learned about. So when you're in photo mode, you can toggle between 16 by 9 and 4 by 3. Now I never knew that 4 by 3 aspect ratio was hidden in there because remember, a 16 by 9 aspect ratio image is just cropped from the larger 4 by 3 aspect ratio in the Mini 3 Pro. Now why is this important? Well, it's generally encouraged to always capture your images in the larger 4 by 3 aspect ratio, even if you intend to turn it into a 16 by 9 final output. And the reason is, by capturing the larger 4 by 3, 
you get an image captured with the entire size of the camera's sensor, and this has a few benefits. Firstly, it allows you slightly more room for reframing your image when you turn it into a 16 by 9. So you can move your image up and down slightly to recenter your subject if it was slightly off during filming. It simply gives you more cropping options in editing. <laughs> the other thing it allows you to do is easily turn one image into both a landscape image and a portrait vertical image for social media platforms such as Instagram. Now here's a little menu quirk that you have to remember. The choice to toggle between 4x3 and 16x9, that option, it only appears in manual exposure photo mode. So when you're in auto exposure photo mode, you can't switch between the two aspect ratios. So you have to go back into manual exposure, change to the aspect ratio you want, then you go back into auto exposure. And remember, this 4x3 aspect ratio, it's only available in photos, not for video, unfortunately. But I love that this option is there, and that's new news to me, and some of us. Anyway, party on, Wayne. Oh, so if you're new to the channel here, you might be wondering, who is this clown? Well, <laughs> I'm a third generation filmmaker, and I became obsessed with these little flying cameras a few years ago. So now I'm full time here on YouTube creating these playful little tutorials. Guys, I'm working on some of my strongest episodes right now. I promise they will inspire your creativity. So click that subscribe button down there and climb on board my flying filmmaker friends. If you've been unfortunate enough to crash your drone or maybe you just clipped the barbed wire fence at your local penitentiary, well, now you need to replace one of the propellers. And how frustrating is the tiny little screwdriver that comes with the drone? It is not ideal for removing these little screws. I find that the Phillips head is slightly too big. Combined with the tiny body of the actual screwdriver, it makes it hard overall to remove these screws and typically results in stripping the head. Now it's impossible to get those things out. So what I recommend is you pick up a higher quality screwdriver if you haven't already. So the correct size is a Phillips head triple zero, which is the same as 1.5 mm. So the bigger size of the actual screwdriver body makes it easier to grip and press firmly as you're slowly turning the little screws and that prevents stripping them. So I found a few screwdrivers on Amazon that are perfect for this. I'll put the links down below if you're interested. And when it comes to changing the propellers, it is very important to make sure that you don't over tighten the screws. When the drone comes from the factory, you'll notice that there's a little bit of vertical wiggle room and the props always turn freely. This is incredibly important to maintain. So when you put on your new prop and you're seating the new screw, make sure you're seating it firmly but that the prop can always turn smoothly. That is muy importante, chicas. Now, some guys upload firmware updates and they don't actually go into all the little details of the new features that are being added. Not long ago, a few very welcome additions were added that will make the drone movement smoother and more customizable. First, you wanna make sure you have the latest firmware downloaded and installed on the drone and the controller. Now, we wanna to go to the settings menu, go to control, scroll down and you'll see the option for gain and expo tuning. Now, if you press enter here, you'll see you can change your max horizontal speed, max ascent speed and max descent speed for cine normal and sport mode. Oh, a huge thank you to DJI for this. I always thought that all aspects of the cine mode were still too fast. And an additional adjustment point has been added. Many of us agreed that in cine mode, just a tiny joystick input caused a big change in the drone. Very sensitive. But now we can chill out those joystick inputs by going into cine gain and expo tuning. So the drone responds slower and we can use more joystick movement to enact the same amount of drone movement. It's just more relaxed, kind of like the dude after his third white Russian. 
And if you guys are interested to see where I changed my Cine Gain and Expo settings to, you can take a screenshot here and try these settings for yourself. For normal and sport mode, I kept them stock factory settings, but Cine mode, I slowed down to these settings and I'm very happy now. There is peace and harmony in the world. It's safe to say everyone has lost signal with their drone during a flight at least once. So it's really useful to remember we can change what happens when the drone loses signal from the controller. So by default, our, when our drone loses signal, the return to home will be engaged. And of course, that's when the drone rises up to a set altitude returns back to where it took off from, and then lands. But that might be a problem in a few different cases. If you're flying in a tight spaces, such as a wooded area, if the drone loses signal and initiates a return to home flight, it could rise up into branches or maybe there's power lines nearby. Another example where you would not want the drone to return to home and land during a lost signal is if you left from your takeoff spot, meaning you launched the drone, then you started hiking or biking during the flight. It's possible you're a very long distance from that initial return to home location. So it's very useful to remember you can change the signal loss instructions to best suit the situation you're in. But obviously you gotta remember to make that adjustment before you start the flight and lose the signal. To do this, we wanna to go to the settings menu under safety, scroll down to advanced safety settings. Then in here, you'll see three signal lost options. First is the default return to home. And this is good if you're in a wide open area. For some reason, the drone loses signal and maybe you're suddenly blackout drunk. The drone can easily return back home, land safely, and it doesn't need your help. But if you're somewhere such as a forest or you know that there's a lot of power lines around, that's where having the drone rise up might cause problems. So you can either have the drone descend and land if the signal is lost, or you can just choose to have it hover in place. Then you can walk towards it until the signal is regained. Oh, this is important. Suppose, for example, as we said earlier, you're no longer at your original return to home location. You could be miles away because you're hiking or bike riding, or maybe you're on one of those dang electric scooters. No comment. Trust me, I want to comment, but no comment. You'll want to update the controller to your new return to home location. Go to settings under safety, scroll down and press the update home point button. You know, a lot of these little functions, we all know about them, but we forget about them sometimes. That's why I include them here as a little reminder like this. So we can control the gimbal and zooming in or out using the touch screen on our controller. Now to zoom in using the touch screen, you simply want to use your two fingers on the screen. Just do your pinch to zoom in pinch to zoom out exactly as you do on your smartphone or on your iPads. You can see here it's telling you exactly how much you're zooming in. It's important to remember this is a digital zoom not an optical zoom. So a zoom lens varies the focal length without degrading the image resolution. But the Mini 3 Pro has a fixed focal length. Therefore the digital zoom is slightly decreasing the resolution. But if you're recording in 4K and you zoom in like 1.5 times or even two times, you still have plenty of resolution left. Remember, 4K has four times more resolution than 1080p. So don't be scared to hear that some sharpness is being lost with this pinch to zoom option. There's been plenty of times where my drone was at the maximum distance away and I still wanted to get a little bit closer. So I zoomed in using this pinch zoom and it looks great. I'm glad I did it. To move the gimbal using the touch screen, you simply want to press and hold on the screen. And now if I move my finger upwards, you can see I'm moving the gimbal up. And if I move my finger downwards, moves the gimbal downwards. Yes, of course, the scroll wheel on the controller does the exact same thing. 
but some people might find the touchscreen gesture to be more precise and just more preferable. So there's that. Have you heard of the United States Drone Society? Well, it's an organization that was launched by my buddy Paul, and it's grown into such an incredible group of people who are simply in love with our flying camera hobby. But the best part is, there is no negativity. It is 100% supportive people. No one loses perspective. That is, this is just a fun, creative hobby. So they have a Facebook group and they have a super fun live stream every Sunday night, 8 p.m. New York time. So I'll put the links down below. You should check them out. Most of you know about screen recording on your controller. I'll just show you where it's located on the RC controller, then two interesting points you might not know about. To start the screen recording, slide down to bring this screen up. Then click on screen record. It'll bring up this little time code and the stop button. Now it's important to know that you can only screen record if you have a micro SD card inserted into the RC controller. I frequently screen record when I know that I'm gonna go back to the same location multiple times to keep perfecting the shot. I wanna have all of that on-screen data, like height and distance and camera settings and everything. I guess it's the cinematographer in me when I wanna keep improving on a local scene. Knowing the settings I used last time helps me know what I've tried and what I haven't tried yet. And here's a cool tip. I used to keep a, a crappy, slow micro SD card in my controller because the screen recording is like less than 1080p. So it doesn't need an expensive, fast micro SD card. But I was once at a stunning scene. I drove a few hours to get there and mid-flight, my SD card in the drone, it filled up and I didn't have any additional micro SD cards with me. I remembered, oh yes, I could just put the micro SD card from my controller into the drone, but it was an older, slow micro SD card, so I couldn't record in 4K. So now I always keep a large, fast micro SD card right in my controller, just in case my drone card fills up I've always got an extra card stored right here in my controller. Remember, two is one and one is none. If you want to stick around for another episode, I recommend this one here where I focus less on settings and more on the creativity of drone cinematography while still remembering to have fun. So click here to check it out and I'll see you in the next one, my flying filmmaker friends.